And now we welcome Dr. James Abington, who will present a workshop on congregational singing and hymns. In this portion, Dr. Abington lifts up Black Methodist bishops who were hymn writers. Additionally, the executive officers of the Music and Christian Arts Ministry will sing through several hymn verses. Please enjoy this presentation. I am delighted to be with you for this topic that is very dear to me and it has become probably the central part of my work in academe and research as well as in practice as a musician who actually uh, plays in church on Sunday morning and teaches through the week. Uh, I hope that my congregation uh, will think that I am a church musician and not just a musician who works in church. You know, there's a difference. Uh, we have a lot of musicians who work in church these days, but they're really not church musicians in that the church is not in their heart and what we do is not in their heart, just uh, the amount of time that they are required to be there and the compensation that they need to receive before going on to their next gig. But you don't have that, uh, those issues, yeah, certainly in churches uh, in the African Methodist Episcopal uh, family. I have several things that are on my mind, and I hope that these will be beneficial to you. I don't think it's anything that you probably don't know that you have not probably said, because all of you are leaders in your churches, but I think we are at a point in our history as African Americans that we are about to lose a major tradition that we have been known for for as long as there has been a black church or enslaved Africans in America who worshiped God. Black folk have always sung. We just, we sang when we didn't have anything else to do. We sang to pass the time away. We sang to uh, deal with pain. We dealt, we sang to, to express joy. All human emotions were in singing. But certainly when enslaved Africans in America either gathered in those invisible institutions and brush harbors, they did not have to be coached to sing. They didn't need a praise leader telling them, everybody open your mouth now, touch your neighbor, say you better sing and all of that. If anything, the big problem was to get them to stop singing. 
I remember growing up Pentecostal, we used to have something called testimony service. And testimony service was this period of time after kind of the devotional period where they would allow people, this usually was on Sunday nights, they didn't do this on Sunday morning, but they would allow people to sing their favorite song, a little, fav a little bit of their song, and then they'd testify and go on to somebody else. Now, it wasn't that simple because if somebody sang a song that got the fire going, they'd have to kind of slow them down because somebody else would be waiting. Uh, but the leader would say, now I want y'all to be like popcorn now, like they had to be told and just be popping for Christ. Oh, they would start singing. As I said, the big issue was to get them to stop singing because people just felt the need to sing. There were no things to distract them. There was no instrumental music. There was no one who sang solos. There were no other distractors. Everybody sang as a community. And it was in that communal singing that black folk made it together. As fast forward to the civil rights movement. Much of it was fueled by singing. and People being able as they marched to sing and as they, they became uh, tired because of things that <laughs> like we're dealing with today. Folks started just singing and the song in many cases gave them the energy and the perseverance, the will to survive. I can't help but think of the rich history of the AME Church and I'm thinking of that wonderful uh, account that is told by Daniel Payne in his recollection of 70 years. He was recalling what was the first time that a choir had ever been introduced in the singing of the Bethel Church in Philadelphia in 1841-1842. Now imagine what had been going on in worship since 1794. Folks were sure enough singing. You know, it was, it was a time where people were, uh, were, were, were serious about church. There was a drive. There, they wanted to go to church. They wanted to sing. They wanted to hear preaching. So they didn't have to be coached. They didn't have to be begged. That was just what you did. But according to Payne, in 1841 and 1842, when choral singing was introduced in the Bethel Church, it is said the people responded, you have brought the devil into the church, therefore we will go out. You all know that story? You've heard it. And he said, and many of them did and never returned. Now you have to ask yourself, what was really going on there? I'm just curious. Those, let's make it interactive. What do you think, what do you think was on those folks' minds? Why did they respond like that? You brought the devil into the church. What, what was their response uh, uh, attributed to? The rhythms? Okay. Okay. Ah, yeah. Anyone else? Keep, keep, keep going. You, you, that, that's great. We've brought something in here that doesn't feel like us. In other words, the whole congregation has been the choir up to this point. Much like that praise service that I was talking about, or that testimony service in the Pentecostal services, there were never choirs singing during that point. It was the whole congregation. All you needed was a leader, and that leader started, and everybody fell right in and sang. But all of a sudden, the presence of this choir, resembling the dominant relation, I guess maybe some of them had uh, flashbacks of the St. George's Church, or this kind of structure. In other words, it's a way of saying, we, we need to arrive. We need to become more disciplined. We need a choir. So what do you think the congregation is doing while the choir is singing. Sitting there, listening, watching, becoming spectators, 
being entertained. Is this starting to sound familiar? So the folk protested that. So where they were normally singing, now there's a group of people that are singing for them or singing to them. So they have now become, as I said, spectators. They've become an audience. They are no longer a congregation. There's a big difference between an audience and a congregation. And a footnote to that is a quote that I love by A.W. Tozier, who says that churches that have not been taught to worship must be entertained. And those who lead in the music and in the preaching must provide that entertainment. So, when you become an audience, you have that kind of expectation to be entertained. When you're a congregation, you know that there's a part of your participation that is required. You don't sit quiet. This, I think, may have robbed us some years ago, and I think I can put my finger on it, but as, as choirs, particularly as gospel choirs, senior choir number one and senior choir number two and the inspirational chorus and the male chorus and the anointed voices of praise and every other choir that name that we could come up with. Oh, we got to have the pastor of uh, the Reverend Richard Allen Memorial Choir and all of these choirs that developed that every Sunday you had a, another choir singing. That's a whole lot of people singing. And you wonder who in the world could be left in the pews. Now, you know, sometimes you look up there and see that same person just in a different robe uh, that sang in all the choir. But the more the choir began to sing and the more there became this emphasis on something happening up front as opposed to happening within the body, people started becoming audiences. And they started expecting it. After a while, well, what do they sound like? Mm, I didn't even like that. She missed that note. That don't even sound good. Sound like an opera. And, oh, that's just too much. What's all that rocking? Oh, you know all the criticisms. Because the people are now not participating. They're watching. I worry about that today, even in praise and worship groups. When they say everybody come and praise and worship, Boy, you turn those mics off and just listen to the congregation, you might be very disappointed. Because the mic systems may be loud and because there's a lot of thumping and rumbling does not mean that the people are singing. And there is nothing more beautiful than the singing of a congregation. I like to think of it as the primary choir. It is the primary choir of the church, the congregation. Now that group that rehearses on Tuesday or Thursday night and comes and sits in front or in many churches, in, in the early churches, they sat in the back. You could only hear them, you couldn't see them. Or in some churches, they sat on the side and split chances. But boy, when we started putting them up front, it was more like putting them on stage. That's why now in a lot of churches you will see where they're doing broadcasts, they'll tell you to make sure that you take the cameras off the choir while the preacher is preaching or someone else is up there because there's no telling what you might get. Uh, of course, not, not anything that you see, but folk on their cell phones, folk sleeping, folk talking, folk doing all kinds of things, but really being attentive. But you're up front Let's face it, there's nothing else for them to do but see us if we're up front. But this whole idea of the choir taking the role of the congregation is problematic. It was problematic back in 1841. Because people who had been allowed to worship, people who were used to singing, people who came looking for this to be their spiritual fuel, now was robbed of some of it. Now, that was then. This is now. 
The singing of hymns in the church has almost become non-existent. I remember several years ago in a lecture at the Hampton University Ministers and Musicians Conference, Dr. J. Wendell Mapson made the statement that congregational singing was breathing its last breath in the intensive care unit. Many folks thought that was a very, that was, that was, that was, that was a little rough. That was, that was being a little too critical. Oh, could he have imagined that there would come a day where now churches don't even have hymnals. Now, I am aware that we, we are not here to do a workshop on COVID related. All, all of us, every one of you sitting here have had the challenges of what do you do in your church when you can't use, can't have a Bible, can't have a hymnal, can't have, well, can't have service, really. Those of us who have had to continue to keep things going by way of live stream or to keep doing, there are all kinds of restrictions that we've had to do. But some churches have just never had to worry about him books at all. Because there is no singing of the congregation. And I'm not against praise and worship. Please be careful not to go out and say, oh, he's just against praise and worship. I'm not. In fact, just like I love praise and worship and think it's appropriate. I also think lament is important in church. Did you catch that? Just like praise and worship is important, so is lament. Where is my authority for that? The book of Psalms. 48% of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. So everything is just not praise and thanksgiving it. Feeling happy and just being, you're, you're watching people die. You're watching people, uh, uh, their, 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 their bodies wither away. You're watching people lose uh, 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 of their jobs. You're watching them lose their homes. And, and, and it ain't time, just, just praise the Lord, just praise the Lord. Even though, the, even though you're out there on the street, just, you know, just praise the Lord out on the street. No, it's time to lament. And the church needs to give the congregation that same space. That obviously the Psalter felt to give in the 150, 48% of them being laments. And lament leading to praise. It's still being anchored. It's not sitting around having a pity party talking about how bad it is. And I'm not talking about lament meaning complaining. You know the church complaining and stuff. It too hot. It too cold. That, 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 that seat too hard. This, I'm not talking about that. That's, you know, that's, 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 that's just us being us. I'm talking about the idea of having balance in what it is that the congregation experiences when it gathers. Dr. Abington, hymns are so important in the life of the church, mm -hmm. particularly the black church. What's your personal experience with hymns and how they have blessed you and your foundation and upbringing? Well, I uh, appreciate you asking about my personal experiences. I don't get to talk about those often. Um, I was born and raised in a little coal mining town in West Virginia, Gary, West Virginia. And uh, when I think about that church, it was a little Pentecostal church. It set up on the side of the hill on the other side of railroad tracks. But when I think about the richness of learning hymns in that, that small congregation having to learn to play them as they were written, um, I can remember so many now that I don't even hear some. Mm -hmm. There was a hymnal that we used as, when I was growing up called the Tabernacle Hymns Number no. 3. And I think we literally had to learn every hymn in that book as children. And then. There was a hymn book that they bought called Favorite Hymns of Praise. But we sang hymns regularly, and I just did not realize how I was being formed, mm -hmm. or I should say even mm -hmm. transformed, in a little coal mining town as a young person. Of course, my mother was a singer, played piano, and then, of course, I came along playing, and so it was just... Uh, it was just mandatory. Now I started playing, I started taking piano lessons, but I started playing by ear. 
So I wasn't interested in being disciplined to the page. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I could play it better than what was on the page. But I can remember people in the church insisting that you play it as it's written and then you can do all those things. But oh my Lord, so many of the titles that I remember, I don't even hear sung mm -hmm. in churches today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, oh, or just as the more I think, I can't even start naming them because they're just it's like a big ocean. Yeah. Uh, you are a student of Wendell Whalum. Yes. What was his impact on you as it relates to hymns? I know he arranged several of them, mm -hmm. and um, well, what, what was his impact on you? His impact was tremendous. Uh, I admired him for so many reasons. He uh, was a great organist. Uh, practically uh, all of my service playing uh, is influenced by his service playing. He was one of the greatest service players that uh, I think could be found anywhere in addition to being a choral conductor, but he loved the church. Yeah. Uh, and he may have been the director of the Morehouse Glee Club and the chair of the department, but he could be found in church mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the weekends. And uh, I think that was uh, that, that statement that I made about there are church musicians and then there are musicians yeah. who work in church. He was a church musician. And playing, well, as an organist, you have to learn to play hymns properly, and it's uh, it, it, it's a little more... Uh, trying to play them uh, accurately and appropriately on the organ than it is certainly mm -hmm. on the piano. But he was very insistent, uh, insisting of that. And he also uh, challenged me to always look for new hymns uh, and sight reading. He felt that the uh, the ability of any church organist should be should begin with being able to play mm -hmm. every hymn in that hymnal, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a masterful hymn pl uh, player and improviser, uh, and I wanted to be like him, and so that just uh, following him and being with him and hearing the work that he did and the arrangement of hymns uh, was great. But he was, in addition to being a scholar, in addition to being um, very uh, well respected in his field. He was a he was a practitioner of church music and uh, and loved folk music. Mm -hmm. He loved mm -hmm. the the spiritual. He loved the music that was not on paper. Uh, yeah. That uh, was just uh, genuinely folk music. Much of that influence he admitted came from John W. Work the third. Right. Uh, but. Uh, he certainly tremendously influenced yeah. uh, my my academic development. But then I have to say that my growing up in West Virginia and in my little church, I certainly uh, that was quite a prerequisite for coming to Morehouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, what's your favorite hymn? Oh wow, that's always a difficult <laughs> one. But uh, I think the one that probably means most to me, in fact. Uh, I did an interview some time ago for the Hymn Society in the United States, in Canada, and we were asked, they called the, the, the fellows, uh, the favorite hymns of the fellows, or something like that. It was kind of a play on the word, We because we're, mm -hmm. we're fellows of the Hymn Society. And of course, there are women who are fellows, so we have a big play on that. But each one of us were asked to talk about our favorite hymn. And uh, when I think about it, uh, and I think of the many texts, and there's so many that I love, uh, and for so many different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that I find myself returning to is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Yes. You know, the morning by morning new mercies I see. When I wake up every morning, it's just a gift. And everything that I have need of, God has provided, has continues provided. to provide in ways that... I don't always see, don't always know, but God's faithfulness is just overwhelming. And that's, I, I love that, just that that, uh, that phrase, morning by morning, of course, yeah. taken from Lamentation, but uh, uh, I don't think that there is any that means uh, as much to me mm -hmm. as that hymn. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that has for many, 
occasions been a hymn that I choose to improvise on if I'm asked to play. And I've heard it, and I've heard you <laughs> and, do that. Uh, I think there's one on YouTube someone asked me about, and I said, no, it was an improvisation. It was, it was God's faithfulness to me at that moment. Yeah. I said, I, if I play it again, it probably be won't different. be the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have that in common. That is my favorite hymn. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And when you think about what God has done and continues to do, mm -hmm. And it's renewed every day that we're given. Right. And I think that relevance to yes. the members of the congregation is important. Absolutely. I mean, what, what speaks to you? What, right. how, you know, right. at some point, uh, listening to words ought to motivate mm -hmm. and inspire mm -hmm. and, and create wonderful things. I remember asking my students, I actually teach once a year over at Morehouse, and just teaching my little brothers is a great thing. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm li literally looking at myself, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in them. But I always do, uh, I open the class on introduction to church music with the Psalms. And I ask them to look at Psalm and Psalm-based things and they go out and they come back and oh man, the, the creative energy, yeah. it, it, the kind of the objective is to get them to listen to texts. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I ask them, well, why? why? Why did you pick that? What does it say to you? And they begin to really listen critically yeah. to the text. I think that happens in many churches. People just sing texts, but they don't really listen right. to them. Right. Uh, but life has a way of making some yes, of those, does. those stanzas right. stand mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. After you've had some experiences. Oh. And I think that's one of the things that a generation um, has kind of lost. Mm -hmm. um, we enjoy the rhythmic nuances that mm. people can create mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and all the syncopation and it's marvelous mm -hmm. what they can do. But when you have lived and you have gone through and you have experienced trials, Absolutely. ups and downs, mm -hmm. happy moments as well as sad moments, mm -hmm. and those hymns speak to you when you're going through and it seems that you don't have anyone in the world to relate to and then pass me not O oh gentle savior mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean it's those words the texts of those hymns that really help to bring life mm -hmm. to our situation and so i thank you for mm -hmm. even what you did tonight just taking us through the beauty of those texts thank you so much for your well, time and to, to it, uh, it was my pleasure and to to uh, uh, there again to reach back and look what uh, yeah. early early hymn writers was doing, but to continue to encourage mm -hmm. new generations right. of hymn writers. As I said, I teach some of the most brilliant young people, and their minds are great. And we just have to encourage they, yeah. their creativity. Mm -hmm. You know, they certainly produce it in their hip hop. Sure, they do. Lyrics. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we have to encourage that, and we have to help them understand that hymn does not mean one of these dull. Uh, right. songs in a book that only has four notes, right. but more appropriately, congregational song, mm -hmm. the song of the people, the what people, the people sing, and what, uh, what, what can you say or what experiences will speak to you, but I think that's something that we must do. We must continue to encourage. I wish I'd had more time to share some hymn texts of some contemporary writers, but there are some wonderful oh, texts that are absolutely. being written, and we just have to explore them and share them yep. with our congregations. And of right. course, a lot of that has to do with the, the uh, what should I say, the continued growth and development of our musicians. You, yes. you can't teach what you don't know. That's right, absolutely. You can't lead absolutely. You know, where you don't go and you haven't been. Absolutely. So uh, it's, uh, I think, encumbered that all of us remain lifelong learners and students yep. of hymnology so that, uh, that we can be effective in leadership. That, that is one of the reasons I wanted to do this as an AME, mm -hmm. um, I grew up Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we did not have mm -hmm. the hymns mm -hmm. like we have in the AME church. Mm -hmm. We had praise and worship, everything that you mm -hmm. talked about, testimony service, somebody would get up and start mm -hmm. singing a song and the congregation would join. So there was congregational singing and some of them were hymns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I came to the AME church, um, there was special emphasis mm -hmm put on the hymn of praise. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday, while I was Minister of Music at Big Bethel, mm -hmm. we would experience the beauty mm -hmm. 
of God's majesty through those hymns. And I have seen, I've seen the church go up in sheer praise mm -hmm. over a hymn that's done right with yes, intentionality right. and the spirit. Um, you know, I, I've said one of the reasons our young people don't have an appreciation for it is because of the way it's been presented to them. That's right. Oh, absolutely. But when we present it with excellence That's and right. intentionality mm -hmm. and show them the beauty of it, it doesn't matter how old they are, they will find oh, absolutely. You know, something that, that moves them as well. So. I agree. Um, I uh, am the director of music ministries and church organist at Friendship Baptist Church in Atlanta, a church that has a very strong uh, reputation yes, for great hymns. Yes, it does. And I tell people probably one of the greatest moments for me in worship is hearing the congregation sing, and they want to sing, mm -hmm. and they sing boldly. I, I just, uh, I, I pray for the day and long for the day that I can hear them yeah, sing again. Yeah, get back again, to that. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. it's just something, and of course, the wonderful acoustics and the instrument oh, in that gosh, church yes. uh, are so great yeah. for singing and. Uh, uh, as many of the AUC students and our what we call choral assistants or uh, staff singers come who are students at, uh, throughout the AU Center and throughout the universities here, they're hearing the hymns and mm -hmm. they grow up to appreciate mm -hmm. them. Many Absolutely. of them have said, Doc, we just didn't know them, but we mm -hmm. really like that one. Uh, we did that hymn, Watch Ye Saints. Yes. Uh, and uh, they're like, when are we gonna do that again? Mm -hmm. And it was just mm -hmm. the, the text and yeah. hearing it done well, with enthusiasm, yeah. and that's and that's it. But uh, uh, we we've done some we've done some pretty bad things to him in some places. Sure. And so sure. that a lot of that has to do with leadership. It does. You know? it, it really does. has to do with it leadership, does. and we have to work on that leadership from the both the pulpit oh, and the right. choir. And the choir. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. But now let's get back to this whole thing about congregational singing. So if that's the only place that the congregation sings. What else do we expect the congregation to do if we really want them to be fully, actively, and consciously engaged in worship? Have you heard churches say, now we're going to change the order of the service, change up the service, we're going to do something where everybody can participate. And you know it's the offering time. I have a friend that told me, he said, yeah, they say that. And I said, no, I can't participate because you got to have something to put in the offering. And I ain't got nothing. So I can't even participate in the offering. Well, I said, okay, yeah, but, uh, well, that's you and God and your wallet. But um, so everything else that was going on wasn't for us to participate. And you stop and think about that. We are guilty of turning our worship services into entertainment because we turn congregations into audience. We take away their ability to sing. We expect them to sit there and to listen to our solos, listen to music that they cannot, the, 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 the choir with his arrangements that are beautiful and very inspiring. I'm not against choirs, Lord knows I'm not. Oh, I'm just against the fact that the congregation doesn't get to at least sing two by themselves. And anybody, most people have heard me say this, a choir that sings over two, three selections, that's a plenty. First of all, you ain't got that much time to rehearse because one of them ain't going to be as good. Rehearsing every week, say, we're going to do three songs. Well, one of them going to be, you know, it's going to need about two more weeks of rehearsal. You say, now, that's the one they should have waited to do on the third Sunday because that one wasn't ready for today. But it said three, so they had to do three. Too good to get two good ones that are well prepared to sing. But why not re give that responsibility to the congregation? Used to be that there were opening hymns. If you've ever looked at the, the orders of worship the, of the early AME church, congregation sung. We started this, 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 this session with that great text by Charles Wesley, all for a thousand tongues to sing in the AME hymnal, still page one. You go to any other Methodist, even the United Methodist, it is the first hymn because of what that means. But the question is, who's singing and when? Well, let me say this about congregational singing. It can be very, very uninspiring by the way it's done. I, 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 I've, I've heard some congregational singing 
uh, that, that was pretty bad. This was Watts' frustration. Isaac Watts talked about how congregational singing in, in 17th century Europe had really deteriorated in the singing of psalms. And it was just bad. He said it was boring. It was, it was disgusting. So Watts started writing because he wanted, he felt that the psalms needed to be paraphrased in language that the people could use, that they understood. So that's why you got all these, what they call imitations uh, of, of hymns, paraphrasing of hymns. And that's, that's, this is what Watts did because Watts watched the deterioration of hymnody as well. You go through the eight, you saw after Watts, you saw this wonderful surge of hymnody in the 18th century, and then something happened, went down again. It's like there's always been this kind of up and down, up and down with our singing. There was a time that singing and congregational singing was better in our churches in the last 50 years. You stop and think about some of our conferences. Someone sent me a clip from the Hampton Ministers Conference, and the choir and the people together were singing that wonderful, wonderful hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ, led by Roland Carter. I was still young. I mean, it was obviously long from the days of King Uzziah, but uh, I was young in those days. I want you to take note of five statements that I often use in my own evaluation of selecting hymns and what I hear. And I uh, am quoting Brian Wren, W-R-E-N. He wrote a book called uh, Praying Twice. Uh, and it's a great book on congregational song. But in this book, he says something very profound. He says, congregational song should attempt to be one or more of the following. Number one, formative. As we sing this hymn, it should form us. It should shape us. It should become for us a vocabulary that we may not be able to have about the Christian faith. It's the songs like, yes, Jesus loves me, those songs that we learned that started teach they were like little, I like to think of them as homiletical miniatures, theological miniatures, little sermons and song. That somehow that, that particular song begins to form and shape you, becomes the, the structure of your life. Formative. Then he says the second should be transformative. You hear it, it ought to keep you going from where you are to a new place in Christ. It should find you here but move you somewhere else. It moves your life. It's, it, it, it changes you. It challenges you. It, it allows you to see more broadly. This text does something that really creates in me something that is new. Thirdly, he says it should be something cognitive to give us something to ponder about. Well, what did that statement really mean? Some of the greatest psalm uh, hymn writers, or I call, we called, many of them are called hymn poets, will make little references, metaphor, biblical references in a hymn. And we don't have any idea what it is. Here's two that come to mind immediately. You know the hymn, Higher Ground? You know that land, By Faith on Heaven's Table Land? What's a table land? Yeah, table land, question mark. We sing, uh, <laughs> come thy fount of every blessing, and we get to that line, here I raise my Ebenezer. Now, some churches named Ebenezer, they just wave their hand to show that's our theme. But what is Ebenezer? You know, when you, when, when you sing the, about the rod of Jesse, biblical references, what is that? But it ought to make us ponder, make us think which leads to transformation, which leads to formation, which leads to other things. He then says, fourthly, after formation, transformation, and cognitive, he says it should be educational. It should teach us something about the church, about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit that we didn't know. Well, we did have songs like that, if you don't believe it. You remember, Yes, Jesus Loves Me? 
for the Bible tells me so. Karl Barth, great Reformed theologian, says it was that song that his mother sang to him that became the most significant theological experience that he had. In that his mother, he knew what his mother's love was, but for her to use this word and say, Jesus loves me, well, who is this Jesus? So he started trying to find out who Jesus was, and he loved me. And how you find out? For the Bible tells me so. That's how he started down the road to becoming one of the great theologians. Remember in school, how did we learn the alphabet? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Now, you laugh at that, but that's how we learned them, didn't we? Learned it through a song. Every now and then you'll see somebody doing, so having to figure out that. Let me see, they said the T, that's the D, H, I, J, K, L, you know. But the song, you remember the, the educational TV? They used to have conjunction, junction, what's your function? Teaching kids about government. I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. Lord, that's a theme right now, I guess. But these, these were educational. We ought to sing hymns that help educate our folk. And finally, inspirational. They ought to inspire. They ought to lift us out of darkness into joy and gloom and happiness. So that when we sing hymns, he says those are five. Formative, transformative, cognitive, educational, and finally, inspirational. Notice what's not in his list. Fun. Entertaining. Exciting. Not that none of the, the other things can't be, but too often we look for songs that entertain and that are fun. I remember as a child, I used to say, why don't they sing some fast songs in church? You know anybody else guilty of that? Why do they always sing the slow ones? I want some fast songs. It didn't matter what they said. I just liked the tempo. I just liked the clapping. It gave me something to do. I could, have been, I could have been bopping off of something that didn't make any sense, but it was just fast. And then I would hear the old saints start singing uh, Amazing Grace, and they would be singing, and everybody would start crying, and I'd see folk, and they'd get all happy people that had been sitting there, swole up like blowfish in a little jelly jar, mad the whole service. They get to that, oh, they fall out, they pass. Their hair pieces start coming loose. Singing Amazing Grace. And say, well, as mean and evil as that woman is, she got happy off of that? But I have lived long enough to know what was happening through many dangers, toils, and snares. I've already come. Was grace. Now, so I understand. Fortunately, the Lord let me live long enough to understand what that text was and what it meant to them. So we must save our congregational singing. We must realize that it is an essential function of worship. And it ought to be one that is done well. I tell my choir, you know, we rehearse the hymns just like we rehearse the, the anthems, the gospel, whatever. I said, because the role of the choir in worship is to sing to the congregation, for the congregation, and with the congregation. And if you don't know the hymns, how are you going to sing with them? To lead them. You know, let's face it. They, they need to be led. But if they look up there and see you, you know, looking at your head text. But some, some years ago, and I had misplaced it, he sent me about two or three collection of hymns by early AME bishops. And I was just fascinated because, you know, there was a hymn written by Richard Allen that didn't make it in the first hymnal. And uh, you probably can understand why it didn't. The title of the hymn was See How the Nations Rage Together. It had about 18 verses. <laughs> and it is not until you read his autobiography that you kind of see where those were. But it was, it, was, it was a great one. But in his collection of 1801, it's interesting to note that of those 54 hymns that 
Allen collected, 11 were by Isaac Watts, two, Charles Wesley, two, John Newton, Lady Huntington, uh, John Ireland, Alexander Pope and others. You can, you can look at that collection. I think every AME ought to see what was on the mind of this man who was compiling, even before what is called the first official hymnal of 1818. But I want to share with you some of the things that I am grateful to Bishop Talbot for sharing with me, and I have put uh, into an octavo, and what a perfect place to share this. I want you to look at this first hymn that was written by a bishop, William Fisher Dickerson. This hymn, uh, well, interesting about Bishop Dickerson, he was appointed bishop at the age of 36. So he was been one of the youngest AME bishops. And here is his text. Now, he lived from 1844 to 1884. 1844 to 1884. So he did not live a long life. But here's a hymn that he wrote, and it is for Easter. And I loved it because here's the text. All hail the morn when from the skies at first gray light of day, an angel found the sepulcher, an angel found the sepulcher and rolled the stone away, and rolled the stone away. But what tune does he use? Hymn tune, Antioch. Well, you know we don't sing Antioch for anything other than joy to the world. In fact, the minute you hear that, you immediately think joy to the world. But isn't it interesting that he would couple this text with Antioch, which we refer to a Christmas carol, but how even more appropriate than to turn around and sing this resurrection text to the same tune that we sing about the birth of Christ. Let's, let's, let's sing a little bit of this. I just want to share these, these nuggets with you. to make this text available because this is one that certainly deserves to be sung by Bishop William Dickerson. I want to now look at one, Come All Ye People. This was written by Bishop Thomas Myers Decatur Ward, born in 1823 and died in 1894. He was the 10th bishop of the AME Church. And interestingly enough, he uses the tune Coronation for this wonderful hymn. Come all ye people, great and small, and praise the Lord your King, who triumphed over the monster death and took away its sting. I want us just to sing a couple of stanzas of
second stanza. congregation with this text written by one of the early founders and bi well a bishop of this church now here's one that we do find in the current AME hymnal father above the conclave sky one that may not be sung as much but this is a text by Bishop Daniel Payne and I don't know if you knew this but this hymn tune Oakville Oakville was written by John Albert Johnson, who was also a bishop. He was a bishop who lived uh, uh, in Canada. In fact, his, he uh, was the 34th bishop of the AME Church, and he was born in Oakville, Ontario, Canada, thus the name Oakville for the hymn tune. Let's just sing one stanza of this. I'll play it through one time for you. may have sung that. If you have not, you should sing it because it is a wonderful hymn by Bishop Payne. This one I find most fascinating. Ministers who are called to preaching by Richard Allen. And he uses, or the tune St. Clement is used with this text by Richard Allen. I will play it and we shall sing. Uh, sing two stanzas of this. beauty of such great singers. Wonderful. Four hymns by 19th century 
hymn writers, hymn poets, all bishops of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, you know you need to start singing those. You need to start singing those. Bishop Talbot, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying, Bishop. Amen. <laughs> oh, God. But in that same vein, I am so excited that about five years ago, six years ago, I guess it is now, because the hymnal came out in 2018, and here we are, 2021. Of course, we lost one year. But in 2018, a very historic book came to be. I uh, was just lecturing uh, from an article of Eileen Southern who talked about the significance of Bishop uh, Richard Allen's hymnal of 1801 and what it represented as the first denominational hymnal of a black denomination anywhere. So it was historic. It was the first, 1801. And then she fast forwards all the way to 19. 21, and the, the, the hymnal of significance was the gospel pearl. Yeah, yeah. You all know about the gospel pearl? Mm -hmm. You still got it. And guess what? It's still in print. You can still get a copy of the gospel pearl. Grandmama and great-grandmama had a copy of gospel pearls. And then she moves on to 1981 for a landmark collection called Songs of Zion mm -hmm. that was a supplement done by the United Methodist Sunday, uh, a Publishing Board. But it was the first time that there was a collection that really reflected the music of African America. Hymns, spirituals, gospels. It, 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 was, it was really landmark. And then there were, uh, there were articles and essays. The late uh, Bobby McLean, my dear brother, gone on to glory was a part of that, and that was a significant accomplishment. I would venture to say that if we keep going down the line, we would look at the year 2001, when the African American Heritage Hymnal was published, and really gave, for the first time, accompaniments and hymns presented in the way that they are sung. And it was really done kind of in a more ecumenical way, not it was not a denomination's hymnal, so it was anybody's hymnal. And many churches have used the African uh, American Heritage Hymnal. But in 2018, there was intentionality in producing a hymnal to kind of come along that same line. And it was something that has not even been done by white denominations. And that was a hymnal that collaborated with eight different denominations, the compilers and the music directors. Uh, Reverend Anthony Vinson was then national music director, so he represented the AME Church. Ingrid uh, Thaniel was there as a music representative uh, for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, African American Episcopal Zion, Zion, A M E Zion. I should have just said A M E Z and been through with it. Yeah. Then we were privileged to have on that committee the national music director of the Church of God in Christ, Dr. Judith McAllister. Church of God in Christ. We had also included in that Black Episcopalians the United Church of Christ, or the Congregational Church, the Disciples of Christ, and are you ready for this? The Seventh-day Adventists, mm -hmm. black Seventh-day Adventists, and then, of course, I was there as the Baptist. And this, this was one of, I said to, I said to several folks, this was one of the most peaceful committees. We, we, we never fell out. We may not have always agreed, but it was a wonderful, harmonious working together. We were not there trying to justify creeds and doctrines. That was not what we wanted. We wanted to have a, a, a compilation of hymns that represented as many denominations under one hymnal as possible. And we were able to accomplish that 
with the release of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, an African-American ecumenical hymnal. And in that hymnal, there is a hymn by a living AME bishop, Bishop Byfield. And we are going to sing. Now, this only has three stanzas, so we're not going to cut any of these. Uh, but it is a wonderful hymn entitled, Oh, Come Give Thanks. There's another wonderful selection in here by an AME composer entitled Come to the Fountain by Lola Robinson. Come to the fountain, come to the fountain of life. Just drink from the fountain that shall never run dry. You just come to the fountain of life.
I know that the time is getting away from me, but I want to give you the text. I want you to look at this text. I mentioned hymn writers that are writing today, and they're writing with the times and the issues and the conditions in mind. There is a hymn in here that is called Sing a New World into Being. And this is an appropriate, this is a very appropriate text to end this time together. I truly believe as the hymn poet of this hymn, Mary Louise Bringle, we affectionately refer to her as Mel Bringle, she said that she really believes that tunes have a way of kind of raking open a consciousness in us and after we have kind of put in these words, they can begin to grow and become a reality. And that's uh, the, the, this soil, if you will, begins to uh, become very fertile. And before you know it, people have actually sung things into being. Mm. And she, she believes that. And I think that's true. But we've got to have people and we've got to let people sing. I'm going to ask you to do something that I think is a very healthy congregational move. <clears throat> Even if you don't sing and you don't know the tune, and we certainly don't have time to exhaust that, but there is just something wonderful about the sound of responsive reading and the congregation reading a common text. Because the community is connected with the words. When we sing, we're connected with the text and the tune. But I would like for you, with me, if you would, to just read this text as poetry and see what it's saying. And if this does not express what I think uh, I may have failed in saying that we need to sing a new world into being. And we need to do that through our congregational singing and being intentional about it. Let's, let's say this text together. Sing a new world into being. Sound a bold and hopeful theme. Find a tune for silent yearnings. Lend your voice and dare to dream. Dream a church where all who worship find their lives and loves belong. Sing a new world into being. Sing as Christ inspires your song. Sing a new world into being where each gender, class, and race brings its rainbow gifts and colors to God's limitless embrace. Where the lines that once divided form instead the ties that bind. Sing a new world into being, risk transforming heart and mind. Sing a new world into being, where the homeless find a home, where no children ever hunger, but are filled in God's shalom. Where all people work for justice, where all hate and vengeance cease. Sing a new world into being, Raise the harmonies of peace. Sing a new world into being. Join the ancient prophet's cry for a time of health and plenty when all tears have been wiped dry. When compassion flows like water, pouring balm for all who grieve. Sing a new world into being. Live the promise you believe. What a text for a time as now. Thank you so much, and I pray that as you go back to your churches and back to your places of your stations of duty, that you will be encouraged, that you will have a renewed interest in the congregation as the primary choir and assigned to it in worship its place as a singing community, a healthy and vital community that sings and sings boldly to the God that created. Thank you so much.
We would like to thank the Reverend Dr. William Watley and the entire staff of the St. Philip AME Church of Atlanta, Georgia, Minister of Music, Latanya Moore Copeland, Dr. James Abington, and all others, the bishops of the church, the connectional and general officers, and of course, to our own producer, Brother Jarrell Pridgen. Thank you for helping to make this documentary possible.